Right now, let's talk some Apple as that's what's in front of us here today. The developers conference begins at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Expectations running high, one analyst are calling it the biggest event in a decade. Joining us for Morningstar, William Kerwin's equity analyst covering the stock. Tom's here in studio with me, going to look at some of the options around this. Uh, William, so uh, is this the biggest Apple event in a decade? What do you think? I think that's a fair way to characterize it, Oliver, uh -huh. at least on the software front. So we're expecting a lot of announcements today in terms of Apple integrating generative AI into features, into its products. So we don't think Apple is going to announce a large language model of its own today, but a partnership with OpenAI, maybe a partnership with Google Gemini as well, and integrating that model into messages, into Siri, into Safari, and potentially a whole lot more. Okay. Now, in terms of, well, well I'm just going to say in terms of how yeah, we, I'll, I'll yeah, just jump in real quick because this is what I think is because uh, I'm trying to like when we think software versus hardware, where is that line here? Uh, William for Apple because you know they could in theory like do an update or something where people could get some new tech if it were pure software but do they want to get an actual new device powered or something do they want to get people to come buy a new device in short yes you know the software is what drives the sales of the hardware so we expect that you know there will be some functionality that you can use in an existing iPhone but that really to get the full functionality of these new features, you'll need upgraded hardware, and that'll drive a stronger iPhone upgrade cycle in 2025 with the iPhone 16 that we expect to release this fall. So we think the focus will be software today, but that inherently that requires new upgraded hardware to really get the full use out of it. Okay. So uh, Apple intelligence, how much this is going to be uh, uh, powered by their own tech? How much is going to be relying on partnerships? Uh, and is that unique for Apple uh, to need to uh, tap into others' technology? We think it'll be partnerships initially, but you know the rumor is that Apple is working on its own model in the background and that that's maybe something they'll go to down the road. You know, Apple really focuses on security and privacy. And so the more that it is able to own, we think longer term, it may choose that path. But this is not new for Apple. It already partners with Google for search in its Safari browser and for the spotlight search on the iPhone. So we think this is more of following a pattern, but it may seek to partner with multiple companies. Again, it sounds like there's a partnership already in the works with OpenAI, but there may also be a, you know, agreement with Google Gemini. So it could be a multi-sourced uh, looking partnership deal. Okay. Uh, obviously they were uh, pretty early with Siri and then Amazon came along with Alexa and well, uh, Alexa's I'm, at least uh, mine's and it kind of stinks. It seems like nobody's really like, <laughs> uh, I continue to be disappointed. The Google stuff is pretty good. Uh, my Google phone, the AI seems to work pretty solid. It seems like kind of the best in terms of existing kind of voice recognized AI interaction. Uh, do they move on from that? Do they fall back on that? What's kind of the view on how they brand it around that? I think they really focus on it. You know, Siri is a product that I feel you're not alone in feeling like it's been lagging in terms of what we expect right. from it for a long time. And so generative AI is really a means to kickstart that and, and bring it into, you know, the 2020s here. And so I think that's going to be one of the key focuses today. Okay. So uh, generally, uh, as far as Apple's valuation, you guys got the fair value estimate 170. So, I mean, for Apple, that's a pretty decent ways away from here. What are you looking for that would shift that? I mean, does that uh, kind of imply that there's more likely to be negative outcomes or is it more that you guys will look at this and revisit price target? Okay, maybe it goes up if they do something well. Walk me through kind of the way you're thinking about it. Well, really, iPhone sales continue to be Apple's primary driver. And so, you know, when we compare our expectations to, you know, what the market price is implying, we just have a bit of a more conservative view on iPhone growth into the medium and the long term. You know, as I said, we expect a stronger cycle in 2025 and Apple's fiscal 25 with the iPhone 16 launch and some of that hardware that'll really give the full functionality of these generative AI features. But 
we think, you know, if you're buying today at these prices, you have to assume a super cycle, if you will, uh, similar to what we saw in 2021. And we just think that's a bit ambitious to expect. So we like the company fundamentally. We have a wide economic moat rating on it. And we do expect growth to inflect up, but we just can't justify the prices at current levels. Hey, would they ever do like a uh, uh, like a different uh, like a model that's AI only, or would it have to be uh, like would they do an AI update that would replace the entire suite of uh, items? Maybe they could treat it like almost to do a different size of a phone. You could say, all right, you can get the Apple phone as it exists right now, but if you want it high power with all this AI stuff, it's at a different price point. Is is that possible, or are they going to make whatever they do available to everyone? I believe more of the latter, you know, maybe in the long, long term, something could shift away from an iPhone type package. But, you know, in the short term here and even in, you know, the next five years, I expect all of these features to have one goal, and that's to drive users into the iPhone, into the Apple Walled Garden ecosystem of products, because that's really where it enjoys the strong profitability, the switching costs of consumers. And so we expect it to continue to be driven by these existing products. Um, but with software to enhance the value proposition. Okay, all right, uh, good stuff. Thanks, William. Appreciate the Thanks, analysis. Uh, Tom, all right, so how do we trade it with uh, the idea of a fair value pretty significantly below where it is right now? Well, uh, first strategy I looked at is, I, t I took a look at the implied vol volatility levels going mm -hmm. into this. They're elevated in the near-term options, which is not surprising, right? Going into the WWDC that starts today at 1 Eastern. So I looked at a strategy that takes advantage of that, but then also gives me some downside exposure if it does sell off. Typically, uh, after these announcements, and stock's already down today, uh, typically they start to sell off immediately over the short term, right? But then uh, two to three months later, the stock's typically higher. So uh, looked at something short term in the calendar family where it gives me that downside exposure. And I went out to the July 5th weekly cycle, so 25 days to expiration, and just bought an out of the money put, the 190 strike put. But then to offset some of those costs uh, on that downside uh, uh, bearish play, sell that same 190 strike put in the uh, July 14th weekly options that expire in just four days. Now, w why do you do this? Well, you pay about an 80 cent debit for it, so there's going to be your low risk, $80 per spread. But you've given yourself a nice wide range between about 182 bucks and 200 bucks for this stock to trade in where you can still remain profitable on it. And I talked about those implied volatility levels. You're basically buying about a 23% implied volatility out in the July 5th weekly cycle uh, on aggregate and then selling about a 39% implied volatility in the near-term options, which are elevated as far as extrinsic option premium due to the fact that we have that event risk. Now, uh, th I mentioned that uh, bre those break-evens around there, like one roll from uh, maybe the June 14th to the June 21st, once implied volatility levels fall after the event comes out and we kind of get a, uh, a gauge of what happened uh, during the event and what they announced, uh, we'll see implied volatility fall in those short options that you sold, and that'll give you uh, some good opportunities to roll or adjust that short strike on a weekly basis over the next three and a half weeks. Okay, so a uh, little bit more room to the downside, yeah. but yeah, it works too to the upside as well. Yeah. So a nice way to uh, uh, capture vol, yeah. uh, basically. So this is being treated by the market as a pretty big deal. Yeah, that dispersion, that implied volatility dispersion lowers the entry point of the uh, uh, the It's kind of like an earnings price. event a little bit yeah. mm -hmm. to some extent. Yep. Uh, all right, uh, so that's one approach, it's kind of a measured, uh, neutral approach, or maybe a little bit of a bearish bias. You got another one too. Is it, well, yep. How do you do that? Short term, where you just want to move. You don't care if it goes higher or lower. You just want it to move. It's not okay. a neutral strategy. It's I need a move type of strategy. Went out to the June 21st monthly options that expire in 11 days. So short term positioning, expecting some movement uh, into the uh, developers conference. Uh, June 21st weekly, I'm going to buy an iron condor here, uh, buying the 192 and a half strike put, sell the 187 and a half strike put. And then on the call side, I'm going to buy a call vertical there, the 202 and a half strike call, and then sell the 207 and a half strike call. So $5 wide, need a move type of strategy here. You're paying a $2 debit for a $5 wide iron condor. Uh, on this one. So you've got a pretty good risk reward setup. Your break evens where you need it to go below or above 190.50 on the downside or 204.50 on the upside on this one. That's about 
two and a half percent to the downside from these current levels and about four and a half percent to the upside to get above or below those break even. So this is just that strategy that, hey, I went out an extra week, so I don't have that higher implied volatility in the near term options. So I'm giving myself a week and a half for this stock to move, uh, you know, anywhere from three percent to the downside or four percent to the upside. OK. All right. Uh, so two very different, almost opposite kind of approaches here. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking for vol uh, versus capturing vol. Yeah. According to uh, Dan Ives, biggest event in the decade. I would think that would be for the second trade then, the looking for a move trade. Yep. If it's the biggest exactly. event in a decade. OK, but um, it might be hyperbole too. Yeah. Fading the hyperbole with the put calendar perhaps.